Hey, Balloon. We are ready to reconvene here with the discussions about exposure. Okay. So this brings I'm all ears. Okay, this brings Paul and Andreas to the table. Paul, do you want to start? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, working. All right. Since last meeting, um, there have been conver conversations between Mike and myself about how to tackle the issue of exposure, considering there's not enough exposure data out there to tackle with. You know, so basically, we have to develop some tackling dummies to uh, help us wade through the problem we have to deal with on a lack of data. So we spent the better part of a month and a half on, um, if you have charts in the back of the, the book, the most important chart, the first thing we did was decide the issues that were out there in terms of what product or source may be there. It doesn't mean we're going to do an exposure calculation for each one of them, but we want to at least lay out in a systematic um, way what we thought the um, product or sources, what the root of exposure, <coughs> what the target populations would be. So in the sense, this is the first order differentiation task. Um, and what we did do is we labeled as our A category, um, children, and you can see that everything from diet to toys were involved. And that doesn't mean that there's data out there, but at least we wanted to define that those are issues for that population. So that's one of the populations of interest. The other one which we thought would be very important would be personal care products, which would be more generally used by the uh, expecting mom's mother or uh, woman of childbearing age. And that's C. And household B is something that would be the second order of concern for children when they're being, well, after they're born, in the first few years of life, since they're going to be spending a lot of their time being rug rats near or close to the floor, and that could be associated with that. So I think we were pretty comprehensive. We probably missed a few things, and anything we missed, please let us know. Uh, on, we then acquired some data. And the data is, you know, sparse. Just to give you an idea of what we're looking for, we're looking at, looking for you know, a particular compound. Um, and so we're looking into cosmetics. So cosmetics is one thing of very important use for adults, and uh, pregnant or expecting mothers. Um, and infant use, uh, clearly, at least once a day, twice a day, maybe, maybe more. Uh, and see what we could find in terms of some concentrations, and we found some concentrations in various um, products. Again, that doesn't mean necessarily that's exposure, but that, that means that there's a concentration there, and now we have to translate. And we have used various tools for translation. Uh, if you go back to cosmetics or for children's use, you can go back to the original pages we developed under, um, I'll say, shampoo, all right, under shampoo, which is A7, A7, uh, one of the things is inhalation in children, which would be a, an appropriate uh, concern, um, baby lotion, dermal, uh, well, actually, sh shampoo, shampoo is dermal, and baby lotion is dermal, right? So we would have to come up with scenarios to take the concentration in the media, the frequency of the use, the amount of use, the amount of absorption you might expect to determine what the potential exposure would be for the dermal pathway. So in a sense, we're looking to generate an internal exposure number, which is the first step to developing <coughs> a uh, uh, daily intake, which will be the next step 
they're looking to the acceptable daily intake value that's going to be generated in the tux uh, with the cancer index. So our goal eventually is to come up with um, uh, daily intakes from each route for typical scenarios and doing it for a daily uh, value. For most of these, they're probably one time during the day when this occurs or periodically say you shower the child shampoos in the morning, shampoos at the night, well you have two 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 uh, exposures. Or if it's a single uh, uh, contact, then it'll be a one you know, basically acute contact for that day. Uh, and you can build that over time if you want, uh, based upon uh, what you'll be trying to do with the um, uh, daily intake and relating that to the you know, target effects of concern. Uh, there are some, I mean, the next few pages are more and more in cosmetics, and they change. The main thing is the, uh, the compound of concern is changes from each page. Uh, uh, then we move down to indoor air and subtle dust which is a summary of data that's been collected by a number of different studies uh, that was done by Wessler and Nazarov in uh, 2010. And you can see that there were studies that were done by at least four other groups. And then you have the backup data from the other groups that are uh, mentioned in the Nazarov and uh, the Wessler paper to show exactly where they got the data from. Uh, this indoor air and subtle dust will be used for two purposes, going back to the original material on the first page, the inhalation, direct inhalation exposure that can occur indoors, and then it can be dermal uptake and ingestion of subtle dust, it could be resuspension of subtle dust, there are a whole host of different ways in which <coughs> subtle dust can re-emerge re and become part of a child's body burden. So we will be doing calculations for a daily intake based upon that. It's sort of similar to what, you know, you have the ingestion of soil in the yard, but well, we're now looking at the ingestion of dust in the park. Based upon activity patterns, based upon the frequency of children touching surfaces and the amount that have absorbed surfaces, these are all things that are uh, considered in those, uh, in those calculations. There's a lot of estimation here, and to be quite frank, we will come up with numbers that have a lot of uncertainty in them, right? Whether or not their uncertainty is any more so than the data that's generated because you have a single um, spot sample that's not of the same person, but you're taking multiple people over multiple periods of time, remains to be seen how much uncertainty each one has, but that's what we'll be dealing with. Uh, we have the indoor air and cell dust from different locations around the country, in different countries. Uh, settled dust in bedrooms, which is another area of concern. Each one of these settled dust studies have, two, have either different locations, different number of samples, or looking at different phthalates. And we have to come up with a, uh, a decision as to which phthalates and what data is going to be used in the analysis. Um, then we have another, we have another set of data, which is basically the migration of various, um, there are two of the PVC and DIN, DINP uh, and DH, DEHP, you have migration rates for those from surfaces, and that would require us to do a calculation based upon children's mouthing of toys and the migration rate from the toys, and coupling those two together come up with an intake value based upon the frequency, uh, the duration of contact, and then the migratability of the material from the surface to the mouth, which can send, in the, in the essence, will lead to an inhalation, a, a derm, a derm, excuse me, will lead to a ingestion exposure, and then a daily intake based upon that exposure. So, where are we? Well, we're still acquiring data. Um, there are three types of data that are necessary. One is concentration data, wherever they're available. Two is the activity pattern data from the EPA, activity pattern, the uh, faculty, 
the exposure handbook, which is being collected. And then there's going to be a discussion between Michael and myself and hopefully Matt Lauber as to which are the most important things to include, uh, which are more most important things to do the most calculations for, and come up with an assessment for like a day in the life of a child <coughs> or a pregnant woman, which will basically show their daily intake from those particular sources or products and try to see if we can come up with enough data to establish uh, a mean 90th percentile, a 75th percentile, 90th percentile of exposure, which would have to do with things like the amount of contact that you have uh, during a day, the number of times you use a product, all those variables. The concentrations we get from uh, various sources will be part of that equation, but the biggest things are going to be the variability in activities and frequency and lifestyle that we're able to acquire. Um, that's where we're going to go. Now, the, the plan is, is that Mike is involved right now with assembling a lot of data. We've been marching back and forth about what's available. In fact, he just sent me an email a little while ago, I guess, CC'd everybody and they just you know, gave me some more data on some of the, uh, I think it was the teethers. This morning? Well, it's it's everything in here. Oh, it's more in there? But oh. it's but it has, <coughs> okay, yeah. there's some backup data that I didn't print out because the book would be. Okay, okay, fine. All right, so there's backup data for, okay, fine. It's not new data, it's just backup. Yeah. Because it looked like it was fairly long. Um, we're acquiring data, and then the beginning of June, we're going to be sitting down and we're going to decide what will be the quantitative exposure assessment we're going to do. June, I think the first week of June, we decided the first or second week. And um, we'll be down here, it'll be me and myself and about Labor and Minimum, and probably some people from uh, from uh, Mike's staff. And that's where we're going to go. So it's work in progress. It's slow. Uh, the reason why it's really slow is because back in the amount of data that's available is difficult to ascertain because you have so many chemicals and there are just so much data available because there's not enough exposure studies being done. What, what would be the main outputs or goal that you would see in, you know, early June, mid-June when you put, I mean, where do you? I'd say by July we should have DIs, daily intakes, for key products, key um, uh, populations, individual populations at risk. So, so it would be for specific, specific uh, products, and then you would sum across the products? We can do summations across the products for individual uh, phthalates, or we can do, do total phthalates, we can do individual. Once, once you do the calculations, you can sum them. Right. You can do you know, the individuals, which I think we should do both. We've done them, it's just a matter of summation. And then what we have to do is we have to define a range of variability based upon certain <coughs> parameters like either inhalation rate or activity <coughs> patterns, the, the, the amount of activity that's a burden that a child has for, uh, for a particular um, uh, product. You know, some kids who do almost nothing all day long, some play videos, or other kids who be mouthing all day long. So you have that range of variability that you have to account for in your um, estimation. <coughs> The 90th percentile, which Holder talks about, would be that child who does almost like pike up behavior. Whereas the person who just sits there as a couch potato, their source of exposure may be, you know, the potato chips that they eat, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So you you have to take into account there are two there may be two high end exposures, <laughs> high end exposure from diet or high end exposure from from the activities surrounding the use of a product. It's a little complicated, it's a matrix that you're going to end up with, but there'll be daily intakes which you can then use to compare to the numerators that are determined by uh, Chris and Holder's calculations. I mean, that's the end, the essence of what we're doing. We all have to focus on how the DIs focus on the ADIs or the, the hazard indexes generated by uh, your calculation. And the, the DI would be a, a mean or there'd be a range? For we're going to go for a median, a 
340 median, 75 percentile, and 95th percentile. Because anything more than that is ludicrous, considering I said the data itself is going to have a lot of instability in it. Anything more than that, I think, would be being a little bit naive. So when you do the summing, you could sum medians, you could sum sure. 95th percentile, yes. etc. Comparable to yep. the biomonitoring data. Yep. That's exactly the way we expect to approach it. Could you say, could you say a bit more about how you get the behavior patterns in there? Is that something you're just going to sort of Wing surmise? Or, I mean, well, we have, is, the, well, we have the exposure factor handbook from the EPA, which is, yes, which basically gives you a range of behaviors, like, you know, how many times a kid touches their mouth in an hour, and it gives you the median, the 75, and the 90, in fact, that probably gives you a distribution function now in the latest version. Uh, so therefore, you can choose what you want to use as your as your values, because obviously uh, that will have a big difference on the, the calculation in terms of the actual contact that you have and the, and the dose that you're going to get. Uh, the same thing for inhalation. You know, should kids is very, very sedentary. If you're sitting in a house very sedentary, their breathing rate's pretty low. They're watching TV. They're not going to breathe very much. But if you're like one of my two grandchildren who runs around like a maniac, you know, until they collapse to go to sleep. Well, then their inhalation rate is going to be a little higher, so you have to have to be able to establish that range to use it. Um, those that, the inhalation rate is a pretty big number in terms of change. The frequency of contact by hand and mouth is a big number. The change is big, very large. The body weight is not that big of change. There's you know some you know seven, ten, twenty, thirty percent change there. Those are the largest, and then there are going to be other factors in terms of well, how many times a day does a child use a toilet? You know, you'll have those kind of things that are judgmental. You have to, if you can get information like that, it'd be great. If you assume once a day, that's kind of, um, for some toys it's okay, for other toys it's not. It's once an hour. What about food sources? The food source is a tough one. I mean, do we have any data on the food yet? Well. well I haven't pulled it together yet. I mean, there are sources, there are papers. Yeah. Uh, may, pro, it, but the food's going to be a lot harder than most of the others. Yeah, it's it, it, it's hard to. We've done di dietary studies and you know, compared that to food baskets here, survey data. They don't, they don't quite. They don't, they don't quite at all. Because the food basket survey is basically on a national median mean, whereas the actual dietary behavior of the child is so much different. You know, you think they're going to be X, Y, or Z, and they don't. You know? and, uh, it's, uh, it's just a it's just an issue that's very difficult to get grapple with. Uh, to grapple with, but we'll do the best we can. <coughs> Can I just ask uh, how we're, we're presumably going to have uh, another approach uh, based on, on biomonitoring and then back calculating the exposures using uh, information about kinetics. Uh, will this be part of this part of the report or will this be a separate? Are we doing that? I don't think we're doing, we're not doing pharmacokinetics, are we? I think it's too sophisticated for the data that's available on you. Well, there's an Einstein data available about tonight, that's a new read. Yeah, well, we, you could actually, that's where you can come up with your daily intake, you know. That's right, that's what I'm saying. But it complements what Chris and Holder. Yeah. If you're looking you to do the next step, which is basically go from what's in the urine back out to where it came from, that's a task that requires a million bucks. We're doing that. No, 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 the, no. We're doing that now for the federal government, but it's it's very, very expensive. No, not so where it came from. I understand <coughs> that's impossible. But no, it's uh, not impossible. It's just very expensive. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead, Andreas. Andreas, if you have a look at our 
Mm, I know. Manuscript, you'll yeah, see yeah, yeah. that we calculate the daily mm. intake I know. for each I individual phthalate. So I know, I do realize that, but and I do realize it, it, it is needed for this, but wouldn't it be sit better in a, in a section about exploratory assessment, because basically that's what it is. Well, that's interesting. Or is this the, or would all this sit better, Andreas, in a section on risk assessment? No, I don't. No, I don't think so. Because the com you know we're comparing the hazard, which is derived from the ABI, versus the exposure, which is derived from that's right. the DIs, and you're doing that comparability now. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, I think we should keep it um, along the lines of of the silver book or the red book. Of a section on exposure assessment. You are you are using one possible approach. The other possible approach is right. using um, <coughs> urine data and then kinetics and back calculate. It would be nice, I think, to have it side by side. And then, am I destroying now the whole hazard index chapter? No, no, you're causing trouble and work. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it's good trouble. Because actually, what you're, su you're suggesting is almost the same thing I was suggesting this morning, except from a different point of view. Being able to link the exposure to the hazard index, you have mm -hmm. to have you have to have a section in the hazard mm -hmm. index that explains why it's <coughs> being done. It's being done to compare it to the external mm -hmm. exposure, yeah. and yeah. Where, where, where what I'm doing is I'm trying to provide the DI, the daily intake, to help inform That's right. that value. That's right. Is it really causing causing a lot more work? In my mind, it's just shunting what you've done, what you've put there, over into a new section, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, so we we have uh, you know estimates, distributions mm. uh, from the biomonitoring what what we would expect to be the daily intake, and so it would be a nice you know table and figure sort of combination to have a distribution estimated from biomonitoring versus your distribution uh, you know point estimates. Um, to see how they compare, they you know. That's right. Yeah. In fact, it'll be a first. <clears throat> well, and also I think it seems maybe I'm jumping to a conclusion here that's not correct, but it seems to me an important feature of this is to be able to say so what proportion of the exposure do we expect to come from various pieces, best right? At can. least the best yeah. you can. Yeah. So, um, and, and is that going to be on a per chemical? Could be as an aggregate or per chemical. Depends. On, it, the comparison will be based upon what you guys come up with. If you're going to do it on per chemical, we'll do it that way. If you're doing it on a total, we'll do it that way. Because what I don't want to do is I don't want us to present something that's dichotomous from you. Because if we do that, then then all is lost. Because then they're going to be picking us. People are going to picking us apart. Say, why do you do it this way for this and that way for that? <coughs> it's not that. It's just the way we present the data for consistency and relevance. I think it's a little hard to say at this moment in time what the outcome might be, but I think it would be very good to have this side-by-side -side comparison yeah. this, using this plurality of approaches. And, you know what it also does, Andres, is that we're probably going to have very weak diet data, mm -hmm. extremely weak. At least this will be able to, we can compare the estimates that we make for these different products mm -hmm. to what the daily intake is, the daily intake is, that they calculate, we can say, well, the denominator here, which would be the daily intake from the biomarker, is X, whereas what we calculate from cosmetics is Y, and Y is two orders of magnitude less than X, or vice versa, then it either is a de minimis part of it, or it's a, ma a major part of the issue, and that <coughs> requires different uh, risk management decisions on that product. I think we could do that, which would be kind of you know, an interesting outcome. Are there other standard um, sort of quality steps in the exposure world where you say, you know, here's our calculation, now here's an external way of looking at it to see if we're in the same ballpark we have? Or, I mean, do you know what I'm saying? Is there, are there cross-checks somehow that are typically done? Uh, the only core strength you really have is basically comparability between studies. I mean, you 
dealing with a, a human observation and dealing with comparability. With respect to the exposure factors handbook, I believe this is a European version of it now. Isn't there? Or do you use EPA? Does REACH use EPA? I'll have to find out whether or not REACH uses EPA's exposure factor handbook or they have their own for doing their exposure calculations. If that's the case, we can compare it. It doesn't mean that it's going to be symmetrically consistent because European children probably don't have the same behavior patterns as American children. So they're uh, different. They're all the same. <laughs> That's right. They're all very nice. So in the, in the exposure factor handbook, I don't think I've ever seen that. Does it talk about? It's, mean, on, it's on the internet. Oh. Just go just go right by the EPA exposure factor handbook. It's 2009. And it's about 700 pages, or maybe 700 pages long. Well, the key, the key thing is, is it has different categories. There's like body weight, distribution function for children. It has uh, inhalation rate. It has uh, a whole bunch of different variables that one would use in certain type of exposure assessments. What we're going to do is select the ones that we feel are most appropriate for this, for this particular venue. So, okay, just so I can get my mind, sorry, um, to get my mind around. So you're, so you're talking about, you're going to assume here's a sedentary child who sits around or plays a lot on the floor. I mean, is that the kind of level you're going to do and then change the scenario to be somebody? Yeah, well, it's, it's not, we're going to use based upon what's in the EPA handbook. We're going to choose it. We're going to say what, what are the one, you know, sedentary versus active child. There's a whole bunch of things. The time, the time duration of activities, they have it down to some cases how long a child does certain things and certain, certain activities. So we'll select what we think are reasonable ones. Yeah. There's always the goddamn fool on the hill that you can't deal with. As a child doesn't listen to anything you say, it still goes out <coughs> and the railroad tracks. But those, those are not the ones we're going to choose. Well, the ban went into effect, and the interim ban went into effect in 2009. Yes. <clears throat> are these data from before and since the ban, or are they primarily? Um, yes, and in fact, some of them are before. Yeah. I, well, they're most of them are in the last 10 years. I think it's helpful in some cases to look at how they change over time because we know that manufacturers are reformulating their products. So. In toys, for example, I mean, there each year there are fewer phthalates, um, and the same may be true for cosmetics and and other kinds of products. So it's it's important to keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. And I think you normally you would give the rate greatest weight to the more, more recent, recent studies, studies. Yeah. and also uh, U.S. studies. Uh, but if all you have is older or from Europe then, you know, that might be what you have to use. I was thinking of an alternate to Europe. We're looking to our friends to the north. Yeah. Yeah. Canada might have a very similar use profile and a similar <coughs> set of toys and things that kids mm -hmm. suck on. But did the ban apply there? Uh, well, they have their own. In fact, uh, I think theirs is more recent. And I think, I think it was they just announced it. I'm not sure what the effective date is, uh, but it's uh, essentially banned. It's essentially the same band that is uh, they have now or will have soon. And you know the world, the the world. Uh, well, Europe and North America have kind of been through this to more or less together. So Europe ban, uh, issued the first bans, um, whereas in North America there were a lot of voluntary bans or voluntary reductions. Um, but I think we're all more or less on the same page right now. <coughs> but because of the ban, or at the time of the ban, some allies should have gone down. Mm -hmm. Right. And in fact, they were going down even before, well, in toys they were going down before the ban. But some of them, either phthalates or substitutes, should have gone up. Exactly. Yes. And we see that? 
Well, it, I mean, there's not that many studies. Yeah. Well, uh, just uh, um, if you're talking about what's in toys. Oh yeah, in, in toys there. You've got well two things. You could use a plastic other than PVC, mm -hmm. or you could use a substitute plasticizer, and they've done a little bit of both. Um, that's for the titration experiment. Well, that's for what's in the products, right? But as for what's in people, uh, what's in people, we don't know the substitutes, yeah. um, or at least for the most part. Um, I know what your is DEHA in, in Haynes? I don't know, but uh, I think in a few years, there the the studies may be shifting to from phthalates to phthalate substitutes, the biomonitoring studies. Well, even even the exposure study, it used to be that you know in exposure studies we used to measure uh, PCBs, you know. Uh, now we measure PDBs instead. Yeah. We switched our chemical of, of the month club to that, and probably eventually when that's banned, we'll switch to something else. But the mm -hmm. studies to define it in the home or some other location usually lags behind two to four years depending upon the ubiquity of use and the amount of concern that's expressed in the community about whether or not this is causing a rampant increase in XYZ disease. Well, we're three years out, so we, we should begin, we're beginning to probably see some of the work, but I don't know how, how well it will be published. I guess I'm looking for some prior validation that if we make a recommendation and something is done about an inter extending mm -hmm. interim bands or new interim bands, mm -hmm. that we would have the confidence that the data from before reflect that something happens. And if we can't tell that there's any change in the exposure from a band, then well, why would we ban something? There's something wrong with the, the assumption that a band would cause a decrease. Right. I think one of the things you have to look at there is basically the product data. See, in fact, if the band has led to reduction in product use of this material and replacement with other use, that can lead to you to make some, you know, a, 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 a sub assumption, make a calculation about, you know, the turnover of this product, and we might be able to get some information on that to figure out how much of it's out of distribution at this point in time, which would lead to reduction in exposure even without, in the absence of data. Yeah, and there's, I mean, there's, the data are few and far between, but there are, for example, <coughs> one or two studies in Germany showing that DEHP exposures from the biomonitoring have gone down over time, but DINP is increasing because DINP has been slowly replacing DEHP. And, you know, you could see on a very broad scale trends like that, but th even those data are hard to come by. If, if there's a movement away from those products that contain those chemicals of concern, that probably means that whoever buys these products have moved into products about which we know less. Mm -hmm. And do we have a good handle on what the substitutes would be in those products that, by surprise, began to be purchased when they weren't before because the, the original ones are now painted. Well, we know what's in toys now, and we know what the substitutes are. Um, whether the, you know, the tox data in some cases aren't as, yeah. are, aren't as rich. And, you know, we were talking about the not just whether the data exists, but whether we have access to the original studies. Right. Yeah. Uh, that was an issue for a couple of the chemicals. Well, I'm just wondering how risky our recommendations are. Because just based on phthalates, it might be clear what we want to recommend. Yeah. But the downstream consequences of that sure. recommendation is something that sure. we're not being asked to consider. Well, well in a, I mean, in a way, I mean, that's why they put in the, the substitutes. But whether the data are equivalent, you know. I mean, we, that's the problem with comparing. It's like comparing routes of exposure. If you have really good data on one route, 
in really crappy data on another uh, that makes it hard to do the comparison. I guess what I'm wondering is if the possibility is there that a decision, a recommendation that we would made if it's followed through would drive to a new set of exposures that we hadn't anticipated. You, you have the substitutes that we know today, yeah. but would this open the door for others? A new substitute that has come along and we have very little data on it, so we jump from the fry pan into the fire. We've done that before. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> Well, we've gone from already gone from DEHP to DINP, and then now we're into the other plasticizers. I, I'm just trying to figure out how we frame this. I, your point is really well taken, and how we frame it in exposure assessment slash hazard assessment analysis, and where you're looking at chemicals that have an interim brand band. So some of them are going off the market. We're relying on older studies. We're relying on older data, which would tell us, you know, basically pre, pre band for the most part. And even there, we'll be able to see, and I will get an idea as to what what their relative proportions are in total phthalates versus their relative proportions at that snapshot in time with other materials that they emitting or have inherent concentrations of phthalates. The question you're asking is a prospective question, which most of us don't have an answer to because we don't have a crystal ball, but what is it, what has the band done to reduce <coughs> the current exposure, the interim band done, and what has the interim band done to the increase in phthalate substitutes that could lead to different exposures that we heretofore have never measured. Yeah. And in the latter one, we can, if we, for at least for, if we choose an example like toys, we probably will have some product data that we could actually in, use in the analysis to say that this could be an eventual possibility. And on the level of scale one to ten, does it, do the levels we project based upon the substitute lead to a same level of concern we had for something that we have banned internally, or is it much lower? And I think that's that's something we could probably do for toys. For other things, I don't know, it depends on how much data is available. But it is a conundrum, it's like with some of the other things we were talking about. We have to at least explain ourselves thoroughly. Well, we, the, the responsibility is that whoever makes the decision in CPSC will be on what our responsibilities are. Yeah. True, although any, you know, um, to the extent that you could make recommendations or otherwise enlighten that decision, yeah. um, we could raise that would be flags. helpful, yes. We could raise some yellow flags here. Definitely. Okay, who else has comments or questions? Bill, anything from you? No, nothing from me. Thank you, Paul. That's good. Work in progress. Andres, work in progress. Work in progress. Um, I, <laughs> I fit in. Um, I, I'm, I'm down here in in this in this section, but I don't know how this happened. I see my role in uh, su supplementing, uh, providing animal data, animal evidence on on mixtures of phthalates and other chemicals and of phthalates then um, moving over into the area hazard index, etc., etc. Let's look back at the assignments. We may well have missed assignment, this, but then let's get it correct. What, what page is that? What page is that? Assignments are near the beginning. Yeah. Well, here it is. Tab. Three. And in fact, I know after these sent out, there was some discussion about, uh, there, there were comments on, some comments on the assignment, and I'm not sure if this captures all of those comments. Well, we have you down for individual and cumulative exposures and other anti 
So, what do you want to enlighten us about? Well, uh, first of all, the individual and cumulative exposures, uh, individual and cumulative, that, that, that laps very much right. into the area we've just discussed. Yes. So, I don't, <coughs> think, I don't think I, I will contribute okay. there. Uh, other anti androgen fact I, I will do, I can do. And really, what, what's my notes really from last meeting don't quite 100% agree with, with this outline. Um, as I said, what, um, there's already a um, sub chapter in, I think, yours or Phil's concerning uh, mixture effects animal evidence. I will build on that, plus evidence concerning phthalates plus other chemicals. Uh, quite a lot has happened very recently there. <coughs> so then in the risk assessment arena, other anti um that's going to be complicated. I'm currently gathering data about exposures for certain pesticides. Uh, we've just recently published about this ourselves. This, um, this is going to be difficult, not easy. Um, but also in the light of the discussions which we have this morning, this will uh, be used as sort of uh, additional evidence to inform us whether the assessments we make for phthalates have to alter in one or the other direction. And other than that, I think I'm, I would be very comfortable um, joining and contributing to the hazard index work that Chris and Holger have begun. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can I ask a question to come back to the outline? Something that signed environmental fate. I don't think there's any environmental fate issue in this report. We're talking mainly about developing exposure estimations for human health effects. Whereas environmental fate sort of gets into the realm of heading toward ecology. Why do we care about the fate transport? Or I just don't think it's necessary. Should we environmental exposure sources? Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Which is no, consistent right. with the calculations. Yeah, we're we're not right. looking at L speed. No. Okay. And then that it's all would, consistent. That would be in the human exposure chapter, right? I mean, that's right. The, what Paul was. Yeah. I think that's what, what that was well, meant to say. Well, fate doesn't. It, ring, it rings yeah. an ecological bell. Yeah. 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 I just wanted to bring that up. With so that later on we didn't <coughs> bring it up. <laughs> and Andreas, I want to make sure we're right. That's a good question. And with, with Andre, the where it says individual ex and cumulative exposures, I wonder if that's supposed to be risks. Um, yeah, that Just talking sense. about the, yeah. the whole that area of cumulative risk assessment, the theories and so on. <coughs> Well, yes, that would make sense. <coughs> the cumulative risk issue, um, Andreas, has been sort of co-opted by the hazard people for the last couple of years. Because when I, you know, I was at this EPA meeting in December, and I was it, was, it was noticeable there was a lack of appreciation that you have to go backwards to the source, which is the um, one of the, the goals of this, this group for CPSC is to figure out where in risk management we deal with the, the sources of this material. So I'm struck by the fact that the cumulative risk assessment has really, is really going away from the whole risk paradigm and more, more associated with a hazard paradigm, which is precluding the, the, the ultimate goal of risk management, which is one of the issues that we're dealing with here. Well, yeah, your observation is correct in the sense that the field is currently grappling, or has been grappling, with um, with the question, do certain chemicals act together in a cumulative way? Mm -hmm. And that's question number one. And number two, can this be accurately predicted when you know the potency of the individual players in the mixture? Well, that's so a this is 
that's it's hazard index. Exactly, right? that's exa essentially hazard okay. hazard assessment. What the field is uh, grappling with right now is how can this knowledge, mainly from experimental studies, uh, be utilized in risk assessment. And hazard index appro uh, approach is one way of doing this. There are well, alternatives um, to doing this as well. But but your observation is quite right. But that's that sort of okay. at the moment at least, where at the least, discussion is headed. Because at least I see mm. where you're heading in mm. now. So therefore, yeah. how we frame this is more of a, more based upon well, looking at cumulative hazard mm. as one component of the risk assessment. Well, one uh, aspect which needs to underpin the use of the hazard index approach is to scan through the experimental evidence uh, to see whether the data are actually in agreement with dose addition or concentration addition, which is uh, an application of the hazard index. So this, this is in progress as well, so sort of going through the data to provide the basis for an application then of this in terms of hazard index approach. And some of that is in the NRC. Some of that, yes, but a lot has happened since then, and it needs it needs to be updated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You um, see that, that NRC. I see that NRC report really hurt the CPSC analysis. Huh. Yes, because because of the fact that it ignored the exposure issues to the point where it was only three three um, pages in an entire NRC document. It was more of a not a cumulative risk, it was a cumulative hazard assessment document. Yeah, and, but we were and, yeah. and and that when 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 you go back and you read it, there was murkiness about what the exposure really was going to but be that provided. Was because the remit for the NRC panel explicitly oh, no. excluded I, under I understood that. We were not allowed to do a risk assessment. I understood that. It's just that the way it was they would have got very nasty with us. Yeah, I know, I know. But it, it, if you read it, it doesn't come through that 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 weakness has to be felt eliminated somewhere else. No, no, no. It says very clearly at the beginning what what the remit is. Yeah, I, I know what it says, but I know how people have interpreted it, and I've seen I've seen it poorly interpreted. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> well. It hurts this analysis because a lot of data is not being collected right now, which is very valuable. And I think that's, that's where it turns. Whereas in this analysis, we have a chance to overcome that weakness by reaffirming the fact that yes. with what we're doing here, we're reconnecting the two, yeah. the external and the internal exposures, which I think is essential for the purposes of what your cumulative hazard assessment really wants to have done. Just an observation. <coughs> so, first of all, you, you, you're in agreement with how Andreas is going to work with you and what he's going to contribute. <coughs> okay. So, we get agreement. Anybody else have any questions for Andreas? Well, one question, I don't know if it's for Andreas or someone else, but the, the section here that says individual and cumulative, I guess we could change the name to risk. Are we meant to be looking at individual? sort of risk evaluation of each chemical by itself, even though we're going to put them together? We're going to stop and do one at a time first? Mm. In my mind, well, there's nothing to yet. What do you think, Barry? That's going to come up tomorrow morning. Oh. oh. How, how, we're, how we're actually going to sort out some of those pieces to, to, to arrive at a risk but that's a very important question we have to answer. Yes. I think it's to the heart of whether or not we're going to look at total you know, daily intake or look at individual daily intake of being well, Let's look at that after, focus. after we've had the full discussion on the hazard index. <coughs> okay. I agree. It, that's why I put it tomorrow morning as a topic of the Anything else before we go to the hazard index? Bill? Um, no, I, if I understand the discussion that just occurred with respect to uh, Andreas's contribution, uh, he's going to lay the foundation for uh, doing cumulative risk 
assessment. Is that correct? Yeah, the, the spade is at the ready. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. You, that's exactly what uh, what I meant. Yeah. Just wanted to be clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I think sure. it. <coughs> that was clear. Yeah. Okay, then let's let's get started on the hazard index uh, and expect that we're probably going to quit temporarily in an hour or so just for a break and then continue. But you have the rest of the afternoon and I think there are we've already had a lot of hints that this is going to require a fair amount of discussion. So but let's get started. Whoever, whoever wants to start. <laughs> you can go jump to the microphone. Um, and you have, a, you have an updated version of Yes, please, <laughs> please disregard the one that's dated um, 314 and refer to the one that's 329. Um, and Phil, I hope I s that you got the one I emailed this morning. Yes, I did. Okay, good. Uh, I'm not sure I have the best way to tackle this. I mean, should we, should we break it up into the general approach and then sort of what the... Yeah. The analysis of the data. Do you, yeah. you want to do it that way? Um, so programming. Do you want to talk about the the formula parts, or how do you? I don't even really know where to start. <laughs> I know it's 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 complicated to. Um, well, I, mean, I guess you know we. Somebody said this morning about the hazard index definition shouldn't be in this <coughs> chapter. Maybe that's true. It needs to come earlier. Um, but this is just, you know, the way we got started, recognizing that we need estimates for daily intake, we need estimates for reference doses. Um, we chose here to use reference doses related to anti-androgenicity, um, similar to the Court and Camp and Faust um, approach. We could certainly do it multiple ways. I don't, I don't know that there's value in saying we have to do it only one way. And it seems to me thinking of it like a sensitivity analysis, if we're coming up with about the same thing from a whole lot of different approaches, it seems to me there's some strength in that. It's, it's not necessarily a statistical test where, you know, this is the way I'm going to do it now to do it. Um, so that's where we are now. Like, I think we could come away from that and, and change those reference doses. Um, so the point here for this approach is to use biomonitoring data to estimate daily intake. And I guess in short, we've done this in a couple of ways, um, based mainly on different um, values for the reference doses, which I think we can hope will be um, sort of supported in the earlier chapters, the, the values that we use there. Um, We've done the analysis from biomonitoring data in uh, pregnant women from NHANES and children in NHANES, which ends up being 6 to 18 years old. Uh, and then we've got data from Shauna Swan uh, in uh, infants um, up to 3 years old. I think a few weeks or up to 36, 37 months old. Um, so, in, I mean, I, I guess so in short, what we've done is we've taken the, the um, six uh, uh, phthalic diasters and we've added to that DIBP, um, so the ones that were considered in the regulation and then the DIBP, um, so that gave us the seven, and we considered them just as a set. And then we also considered them with other, um, we had data for other three, three other um, anti-androgens. Um, we considered the hazard index with, without the other three and then with the three. And then we went back into the Camp paper um, and essentially got constants for an additional, I think, seven or so uh, anti-androgens to just sort of shift the distribution based on constants from a hazard index, and we can go through that. But in short, that's sort of it. I mean, it, we can go through the details of the daily intake estimates. Do you want to yeah. do that? 
basis <coughs> of all our calculations is the cal is the calculation of the daily intake of each individual phthalate based on human biomonitoring data. So this is the core step in uh, in this hazard index approach, and we use for the daily intake calculations, and of course there are a lot of assumptions to be made and we assume there's a steady state excretion of the metabolites. Uh, we use, and that's the nice thing, a formula to calculate this daily intake, which has been both published by the phthalate ester panel and um, independent research from CDC and uh, the Environmental Toxicology Program of the NIEH. Uh, so I think we are on pretty solid ground using this daily intake calculation formula. Um, so that's the formula in itself. Then the parameters we, we use are the, the metabolite excretion fractions. So this data is extracted from metabolism studies, human metabolism studies. Um, some of these studies, we know it's a weakness in this approach, are based only on one or some individuals. But we're confident that for many of the delays in question, we soon will get uh, more reliable data on more individuals. So this is the one assumption we make. Uh, the metabolite excretion fraction. The second assumption we make is uh, we have, of course, ex to extrapolate from the spot urine samples to a 24-hour exposure. So this is the uh, for the children we use the smooth creatinine approach, and for the, the pregnant women we use uh, the normalized creatinine excretion. All this is described in the publications by me and both by the Phthalate Ester Panel and uh, the Kuhn et al. publication from 2000 in EHB. So this is the basis. We calculate the daily intake for each phthalate and each individual and then we sum up that we, we relate this daily intake to the tolerable daily intake and sum up the ratio as the hazard index. Can you expand on what you mean by summing from JSC? Where are you? Oh, on the very front page? So C yeah. being the number of chemicals in the set. So uh, there's going to be an estimate for daily intake for each chemical, the, the, the diesters. Here. There's going to be an, an estimate for the reference dose that we choose. And so it's that, that I guess it's called a hazard quotient. And then we sum that quotient across the different chemicals in the set. So that could range from one individual chemical to a composite of a bunch of them. So your DI is based upon the measured metabolite concentration in the in here, in here. metabolite or metabolites. So it's either a single or it's a summation, depending upon whether you're dealing with total versus individual yeah. daily. And we <coughs> we uh, in table number one we have the meta meta metabolite excretion fractions. So mm -hmm. let's say for monobutyl phthalate that represents 69% of the oral dose of dibutyl phthalate. And using this these excretion fractions, you can extrapolate to the dose of the parent phthalate. Maybe we should add references for each of those. I mean, they, those are all the yeah. ones that are not set at set yeah. at. The others are all, you know, from literature values. So maybe we should put another or something. So each it. excretion factor is from a different study? Most of them, yes. But I think uh, Mike 
we can say that we are aware of some other studies that might produce new equation <coughs> fractions. I think some of the studies are initiated by either the European chemical industry or the American chemistry council, I don't know. But there, we, last year we've been to Berlin, we have uh, heard several presentations on this topic. Yeah. I think they're European. I have a question about the excretion factors. <coughs> when you have uh, multiple metabolites and multiple excretion factors, do you sum them? You don't average. So let, let's take let's take let's take the HP as an example. Yeah. We have four metabolites. Mm -hmm. And these four metabolites taken together uh, represent 62% of the dose. Okay. And we add up these metabolites in urine on a molar basis and then multiply it with or divide it by 0.62. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah. Hatch index. Is it going to be a single number, or is it going to have it's a, a range? Single, it's a single number. That, the, the neat thing about this, I think, is you end up with a single number per subject. Per subject. So and so, there's always the question, um, I think, in terms of um, these hazard indices about what should be in the numerator. You know, <coughs> are you going to have uh, the median for each one, or you know, what what right. values do you choose for daily right. intake? So the neat thing about this is each subject is their own sort of mixture, right? The, the, so from that we would so never... If, if you have a thousand subjects, you have a thousand hazard indices. Per subject, yes. And so you get to look at a distribution of hazard indices to see, you know, and so a lot of this report ends up being, or this little chapter ends up being some histograms yep. to show not only the estimates for the daily intakes, which are back in the, in the uh, appendix in the very back, Mm -hmm. um, but even uh, histograms for um, the hazard index in the various cases, um, you know, with a reference line right. of one or zero on the log 10 scale. Mm -hmm. um. So the, quite the biggest, I guess the biggest source of uncertainty is the ones for infants. We don't have any infants in this study. Except for a small number in that one study from the Mount Sinai. So, um, right, so we've got, um, okay, so if you want to switch now to just look at the, the data part of it. No, I'm just asking, I'm just looking at, you don't have to look at the data. We were talking about children versus women, and we talked about the Haynes database, and you have six to 18 versus adults, but you have a big dark hole, except for that one small study. So we need the data at this point, just trying to get an idea conceptualized with the largest uncertainties. So we got data from Shauna Swan. Right. Um, and that's, we have, uh, I can't remember the number. Is it 100? 100 and someone two. Sorry, I should have this on the top of my mind. 130. 130? No, that's the pregnant women. It's like, sorry. Uh, it's coming. Oh. It's 291 um, children ranging from, you know, a few months old to up to 37 months old. And the thing that we didn't know about them that we made an assumption about was the, um, what the uh, smooth creatinine excretion value was because the study that that came from was actually for children 3 to 18. <coughs> Yeah. So we set that value based on based on that the Reamer study, but um, we didn't assume a continual slope down. We, we set it at a constant. Um, so that's a, an assumption we've made. Yeah. 
children's creatin daily. Diapers are not fun. So the one thing that um, that I still need to work on is um, uh, uh, also additional to the infant data that Shauna Swan provided for us were pre and postnatal estimates or data from uh, pregnant women. Um, and I haven't had a chance to do anything with that yet, so that, that will be added to this. We'll, I think it'll be interesting to see sort of even correlations or, or uh, bivariate plots of, you know, the estimates uh, pre versus postnatal uh, for chemical basis. Um, but just in terms of quality checks, so Holger and I spent five hours yesterday going through this in fine detail and um, we actually uh, confirmed some calculations where he had some data, he had his calculations done and then I use the, the algorithm or the program that's used to analyze these data to add, also calculate the, the hazard index and or the daily intake estimate or whatever. And we were able to um, uh, show agreement in, in the two different calculations. So I think that was a nice, with all of the stuff that's moving around here, I think that was a nice uh, quality control step. So should we go through the data or what? I'm not sure what, yeah. Um, yeah. is that the trouble? Okay. Um, well, okay, so if we just kind of glance at the tables. Um, table two is uh, a table that maybe could be um, linked to what's in the previous chapters. Uh, so this is where we uh, have uncertainty factors and reference doses um, given on a per chemical basis. Um, so many of the, the, the case one is, is largely from um, the Court and Camp and Faust paper. The case two, um, we constructed based on, uh, I guess, testimony or, or results from uh, Earl Gray uh, when he visited us uh, at our second meeting. Um, and we already discussed yesterday that we might implement the case three with the EPA reference doses, although they are not all fixed on the same endpoint, but uh, we can add this case and we can add a fourth case like using the European TDIs. So we can play around this, we can add cases uh, with different factors and reference doses. And I think the value of that is, I think largely what we're going to see is it doesn't matter that much what the assumptions are. We, we get very similar distributions. It's not like one is an order of magnitude off of the other, um, which I think makes me think you know, there's no point in worrying too much about small details. Um, can, can you give a mathematical interpretation of this? My, my first idea to that, why that is, is that the variation in, in your daily intake is much bigger than the variation in the denominator, is that correct? I think that's probably really? a, good, a, a reasonable assumption. Okay, so so, like we say, this table two is what this report is based on. Um, we're certainly, you know, as we develop additional results in the other chapters, we can consider other cases, so that would be something that could, that could be added. Um, so, we're ready just to go through the data then? If we look at. Um, can I ask one question? Yes. Very well. Back in case one, table two expression in fetal testosterone synthesis, why is there an uncertain factor, an uncertainty factor of 200 for the two lower dose levels and 500 for the higher dose levels? Uh, that was described in the Court and Camp paper, and I think there are, Andres, you yeah, may remember yeah, that we, I can I answer to that. Yes, we, we made uh, 
This is, of course, two degree arbitrary. I am free to, to admit that. And sure. One can now go into fine detail discussing this and the other number. But in principle, what we did there, we, had, uh, we made a, an adjustment for the different number of animals used. And sort of, if you like, it's a judgment on the quality of the, of the underlying studies. And we've uh, highlighted in this paper, and I'll say it again, that um, actually none of these studies were designed by the authors for, for point of departure. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with potency of the hormone. It has to do with the design of the study. Yeah, too few animals. Okay. But still, you can derive some sense of potency from these data. That, sure. That's not the problem. Sure. My big, big, just to finish the argument, the concern is that due to the small number of animals in these studies, the estimates for uh, point of point of departures, be that no else or benchmark doses, are are a little uh, dodgy. Really, normally you want more animals in that. But just as we go further, I mean, take a peek at the reference doses in case one and case two. Um, you know, <coughs> hundred and. 330 compared to 50. Yeah. So there's there's some some differences there that you um, you know and so think about that when you see the distributions as we go through this. Um, Did you expect all these chemicals to be that tightly bound? What in terms of a reference? <coughs> Shows a lot of variability based on chemical structure. I would say it's more based on study design and the reliability of the study. Really? Because um, I think that's the beauty of case one compared to case two. In case two, uh, the study design used for all these phthalates here was the same, but it wasn't designed to to define a and OIL. So uh, the case number two is very similar or the same study design for all phthalates, mm -hmm. but uh, no investigation of the low doses. And the right case number one is uh, different studies with different study designs. Just, just another example, in Europe for example, the reference dose for Dibule phthalate is 10, not 100. All depending on the studies that are used. But the, this is the, if you like, strength of this hazard index approach, uh, because I mean we can now begin to argue about finding detail of these numbers. It doesn't matter at all when the when the numerator varies by say three or four orders of magnitude. It really does not matter. Okay. That's quite an interesting insight already. Mm -hmm. And I think the histograms kind of point yeah. point to that. To okay, so if we wiggle on. So um, to look at some results then. So the first, the first uh, little section here is uh, uh, pregnant women. Um, so I don't know how detailed we want to go into these examples, but um, I guess one important thing uh, of the 130 women who were included in the subsample that identified themselves as um, pregnant, um, uh, at least one of the 12 phthalate monoesters were detected in all of them, uh, and seven were detected in 98%, nine were detected in 90%, the lowest detection rate was MNP at 19%. So, I mean, it's you know, a lot of a lot of phthalates in these pregnant pregnant women. Um, okay, just following down there. But so the the uh, uh, appendix figure A one has the uh, distributions of the <coughs> estimated daily intakes for these pregnant women, um, and the, the distributions are on the log ten scale. The units are micrograms per kilogram per day. And on the log 10 scale, largely, you know, 
know, we're, we're seeing things that are relatively symmetric, with the exception of maybe, um, I guess, DNOP looks a little funky. Yeah, but that's the and low detection rate and the yeah. really low thing there. And some skewed values up in the upper tail, say, of DEHP and maybe DINP. Um, but these, I think, will be distributions, and we could put these in another place in the report. But these may be the kinds of things that would be interesting to have side by side with some uh, exposure estimates and general estimates, if you could get to the same units of micrograms per kilogram per day. Okay. So, um, So, um, okay, again, just looking um, through the report. So, um, if you think about each uh, person as being their own sort of mixture, okay, of exposure, right? And so there's a different um, sort of mixing proportion per subject. So one thing that we thought about was to actually look at what that distribution Sort of on average is. So if you look at table uh, three, um, this is again the same pregnant women <coughs> and it tells you, it shows you um, what the average proportion is for each chemical and then what the standard deviation and the minimum and the maximum. So what we see is that, uh, you know, the average DEHP percentage is 82%. Um, and that ranges from 49% up to, you know, over 99%. The others are lower um, in terms of the percent within, you know, a subject on average. Um, and what you see in that table are, are the, um, the means, the standard deviations, minimum and maximum. So this is the distribution for case one. So <coughs> if you can flip over two pages, then you can compare it to the distribution in case number two. So if we use the reference doses from case one, we clearly see that EHP is the major player here. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you flip over to case number two. Which is table four. Table four which is table four. See that it's a more balanced picture there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. So it's still EHP with 53 percent, but the other phthalates are of importance also. Importance also. So one thing that we wrote about here was just to sort of say, so on the maximum side, you know what were the maximum values, and in this case, we see, I think, all but um, DNOP, you know, was over a 50% maximum. So there was at least one person in the, in the um, data that uh, had a more than half of each of these in their, in their uh, particular mixture, their particular exposure. So I think that just goes to the address the issue of, you know, the, the mixtures on an individual basis are all very different, um, as you see from these from these studies, from these data tables. So now I guess if you go back to um, table, oh, sorry, figure two, so we get to the meat of the matter here. Um, figure two, so these are um, histograms in figure 2A, you could go up. Can you go up one page? Yeah. So figure 2A there, that's the histogram for the hazard index for these 130 uh, pregnant women 
Um, and you see the summary statistics there, the mean, the median. So, you know, the, the, if you can't read that, the, the median is uh, about 0.09. Uh, the mean is, is higher because it's skewed, it's about <coughs> 0.37. But there is somebody who has a value of 10. Um, 1%, sorry, am I, am I reading this wrong? So more than 5% of the, of the subjects have values above 1. It's, it's hard to see. This is one. Yeah. yeah. Do, you, do we know what the mode is? Uh, I can I can calculate it. I have it. Would you like to see the mode as well? Um, if you, and Mike, sorry to keep, but if you switch over to the, just to the side of that figure B, is the same data except now with on the log 10 scale. Oh yeah, no, no, I can see the mode. <laughs> <laughs> so now you're happy. But it's a log. Yeah, have to log it. log <laughs> So you see that tail on the upper side there. Um, something that I haven't done yet that we could do if you guys are interested. Um, for the infant data, I actually tried to model the hazard index is a function of covariates, which we can do now that we've got this on a per subject basis. Um, so we were able to show that the hazard index was higher, not here, we'll get to it, in girls than boys, um, significantly higher. So, you know, if, if we have some things you want to kind of look at, I, you know, it's, we, I, I think it's right for looking at things, so in terms of covariates. Um, Okay, so now back to the, if you go back to figure C, sorry Mike. Um, so now the point is, this is now the hazard index for just the seven phthalates. Um, in figure C, what we did is we said, well now let's look at, let's add three additional antiandrogens. Um, it turns out that these additional, so this was via monitoring data from um, uh, bisphenol A, propyl paraben, and um, butyl paraben, is that, is that right? And so it does shift up a bit, but not that much. It's out in the decimal place. Mm -hmm. So, the, so the, these additional um, <coughs> chemicals as the way we calculate it in terms of their uh, the fraction and stuff uh, didn't change the distribution that much. Um, but it did shift up some. Um, figure D is just the, the uh, histogram for that on the log scale. But then if you go down the page, so now this is the point where we get to say, now what about these other antiandrogens? So we went back to the Court and Camp and Faust um, paper, and there were seven other antiandrogens that were considered there. Now we don't have biomonitoring data, I don't think, for those. So what we said is, we said, well, let's just add a constant. So we took the hazard quotients um, for those other seven chemicals, and let me see if I can. Um, then closalin, for chloras, I'm not sure, for simidin, uh, linerin, I don't know if I say this right, penetrothium, um, PPDE, and BDE99. So we took those, uh, they were considered in the, in the Horton Camp and Faust paper with um, using median estimates for um, exposure and then high estimates for exposure. So the figure D here, sorry, figure E here is the, the hazard index distribution where we've added the constant from those additional seven um, chemicals, the, the, the con their, their sum of their constant, um, it's a constant of their uh, hazard quotient. Um, and again, so we shift up a little bit more with those sums. That's at the median intakes, and then the figure just below that, figure G, is if we go up with the, um, the high intake estimates for exposure. So I believe in this case, if I remember right, case uh, one, about 14% of the 130 women 
have values in this case, I think, above one. Um, so that's that. Um, I guess this is all summarized. If you want to look at the summary tables, uh, so table five. So we did this both for case one and case two. I don't know if you can remember the distributions enough, or it might be easier just to compare the summary table. If you go down, um, there's a, a pretty large table five that's got the, um, there, that's it. So case one and case two for the pregnant women. And so for each of the cases, it, it's the seven phthalates alone, the seven phthalates with the three antiandrogens from biomonitoring data, and then that with the median uh, intake estimates from the Horton Camp and Faust paper, and that with the uh, high uh, intake estimates for the seven other antiandrogens. So, you know, the so here's the point where we can compare the distributions just in terms of point estimates for the median, the 75th and 95th percentiles. Um, you know, the medians are are relatively similar. If you just look at case one versus case two in corresponding pieces, the 75th percentiles. You know, I mean, I, I think they're pretty <coughs> comparable based on all of the moving parts here. Um, the 99th percentiles are a little larger for case one. Um, but still, I think it's pretty comparable. Why do you think the 99, 99th percentiles are uh, higher in case one than in case two? I think it's the DEHP is the one yeah. that has some really high intake estimates, and yeah. it's the one that's given the most weight in the case okay. one. But as you can see with the infants in case one and two, uh, look at the 90th <coughs> percentile here, it's case two with 0.75, which is higher than case one. So it depends on the distribution of the yeah. of yeah. the metabolites of the parenthetics. Here at table five, <coughs> pregnant women, case two. Mm -hmm. When you, I'm looking at this on a percentage basis, and asking <coughs> why, at the median, if you look at seven phthalates versus ten and, and ten antiandrogens, there's a triple between those two from. Point one to point three, and you, if you look at the 99th percentile and the 95th percentile, <coughs> they're almost the same. I mean, they're not tripled in difference. There's very little difference. Why do you not have a, a larger difference at 95th and 99th percentile? Because it's the phthalates. Because what? It's the phthalates in the upper percentiles. Well, I remember the the the. Um, the third and the fourth row there, that's just an added constant. So you're you're looking at a ratio of things, but you're just adding the constant. So the, the constant is more important in the middle than it is at the, at the, t at the upper tail. Mm -hmm. The phthalates are dominating in the upper, in the upper tail, and you're not necessarily in the dominant part. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Difference, difference versus a ratio. Right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Same difference, but the ratio is different. Ideally, it would be nice to have biomonitoring data on all of it, but we don't. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then you conclude that the other antihydrogens don't add much of an effect here? Mm -hmm. Doesn't look like it. It, it. You know, relative to the median, relative to the tail, relative to what? Um, Well, they, they have an impact on the media. Yeah. They do have an impact on the media. But not so much uh, on the higher extreme tail. 
because as you say that is an exposure to DHB predominant. Mm -hmm. The tail in the other direction would be minim minimal difference as well. I'm not sure. The tail on the other direction? The lower. Yeah. Fifth well, so the third and the fourth row of this, we're adding a constant. So it's not right. the fifth percentile of the constant, it is a constant. For let's say below the 25th percentile of the population <coughs> that are exposed to the phthalates and three antiandrogens, right? So really shift it up. Because mm. you start with a small number compared to the small number of the, the added effect. I, if I remember right, it's like point one eight and 0.56 or something like that are the two constants. But the other antiandrogens would have more of an effect in the low level exposures and yep. the low, low percentiles than they do in the high. That's right. So if there's a place here where the antiandrogens are having a noticeable difference, it's in the low percentile population. That's right. But I would say even in the middle of the population, even in the middle of the distribution, like, like you pointed out, it's you're going from you know, 0.13 to 0.72. Right, and I'm just looking, is there a part of the population group for which that impact is even greater? And it would be, a, it's not at the high exposure, not at the high percentile, it's at the low percentile. At the medium, the medium area, yeah. And the medium represents the effect of this to the greatest percentage of the right. third mm -hmm. one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there would be a couple for which the of the 130 for which the effect of the antiandrogens was greater than it was for all the rest. Right. But it made it right. If, if they had high levels of an, other antiandrogens and low levels of phthalates, they could still be affected. Right. The assumption is that um, I'm just learning slowly. <coughs> the dose of the antiandrogens of the five per of the fifth percentile is the same as at the 95th percentile. The construction here is that. That's right. So there's seven. Correct. Okay. Because we don't have biomonitoring data. And that's not true for the three antiandrogens, this, the bisphenol A, the um, purple and butyl phthalate. Uh, Heroin. Okay. Heroin. What? Yep. Butyl. No. Um, this is all actually based on biomonitoring data. So that shift there is because we've added additional chemicals. Yeah. Yeah, it's simply because uh, um, frequency distribution and intake are not these data are not available for for pesticides. And, uh, we have to be aware that we didn't add up individual ninety fifth percentile, so it's individual urinary data that was extrapolated. So we might have an individual with high DEH3 but very low butyl uh, phthalate exposure. Mm -hmm. So this is not a worst case construction, it's a yeah. picture of the of exposure, the of the distribution. Mm -hmm. We could model a worst case in saying that uh, let's assume that somebody had exposures all in the 95th percentile. So this is not a worst case. But this might be more representative than constructing yeah. something like yeah. that's typically done. Would the biological effect of these three antiandrogens <coughs> or all ten of them be detectable in the absence of phthalates? Detectable, meaning well, would there be a biological effect of these antiandrogens right. in the absence of phthalates? Right. Mm -hmm. I don't know that, it, uh, you know I mean, like you could just subtract off the first row from from the others. And that would be the effect of the added part. Why do you Maybe. think the median is not part of the... I don't understand. Just making an assumption. Well, so Burns asking what's the effect of the others that right. other than the phthalates. So I'm saying the, the, fac the factor... I mean, this is loose, but the factor that's due to the phthalates is in the first row of each block. Why is it just the first column?
the first row in each block there is the seventh alley spot inside. Right. And so the first row on the first. So I think by any answer to the question is yes. Yeah. It would right. Yeah. So yeah. we're we're imposing the effect of the phthalates on the dose response curve right. of the antiandrogens. We're not down there in an area of antiandrogens where by themselves they have no effect. That's what I'm trying to figure out is <coughs> which should we worry about more, the antiandrogens or the phthalates? <laughs> well I think we're in a data poor case here for the for, for most of the antiandrogens. I think, the yeah. We've got more data for three it's of the probably 50-50 if you balance. I agree with Chris. The, the problem with the other antiandrogens is, is the data quality is poorer. The data quality is good for phthalates. So I think it's 50-50. One all. But because of the uncertainty about that, should we actually be doing this step? I, you know, I understand the point. Do we just keep the first? Row versus columns. Why Well, we're returning to this morning's discussion. I think um, I think it is instructive to see what happens if you factor the other ones in. But why do we have to be so quantitative? Because we're we're because we're, we're, we making, we're 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 making. We can. Yeah, I know. Which <laughs> also can lead us into vast array of, of uh, questions and confusion. Because we don't have the strong enough These data questions base. can be answered and confusion, I'm not sure about that. But uh, I think it's, it's, it's the, the, I think the point to take home here is that it, it isn't uh, per se clear or a priori clear that that the other anti antrons might have an impact on the hazard index distribution of, of seven phthalates. Do we care? Um, For the purpose of this exercise, do we care? I think in the context of what happened before with the NRC report, it, it would be, we could be accused of being negligent of not, not taking this into consideration. What then and ultimately we do with it, with this kind of supplementary information, if you like, uh, is open to debate. It may or may not have an impact on our recommendation. I guess but I think it would be, uh, that's my opinion, politically unwise to totally ignore this, uh, considering what the NRC panel has said and um, considering what's out there and debated in the peer-reviewed literature. But do we have to go to this minimum amount of detail? Why can't we just use seven phthalates plus three into energy? Three into energy. Why do we have to go median intake, high intake, when we're becoming much more uncertain as we go down the list. It's not, it's not much more uncertain. We can do this because the data are there. You should be, you normally are happy, Paul, when more data are there. Yeah, yeah. but when you have more uncertain data, it becomes so no, not, not that uncertain. uncertain. I think, I mean, from the Court and Camp and Faust paper, yes. um, you know, there are estimates that were studied examples of what the daily intake, the median intake would be and what the high intake would be. And there were, you know, considerations of what the reference doses would be. So all that's all that we've done here is just said we don't have biomonitoring data on, on those other seven. No. But they certainly are very likely to be anti androgens. So we don't it's not just that you would start say, for example, in the in case two, yeah. the seventy fifth percentile is point one eight of the seven phthalates. But by considering the other anti androgens the value ends up being, you know, at the high intake, so that may be the most conservative, but it's 0.96, so now all of a sudden you're very close to the to the value of one. So you, I, I the don't point, know what the means. Point, I don't know what it means. I think what it means is you don't start at zero. You start with uh, with other things that could potentially add um, important important risks. I, I think you make a valid point, Paul. We should first lead the discussion only focus on the phthalates. Maybe we can extract just the phthalates in the first table. Yeah. And then discussing the phthalates, what, it, what, what the problem is with the different cases and the different populations. And then we move the interpretation with adding other antigens to another table. 
That would be good because argument. that would separate the argument it rather would separate than the mixing, argument. rather than mixing them up. Exactly. Which is what I'm fearful happens here. Which is which is a quite yeah. fine. Wonderful. So it's presentation is what it's, you're it's, yeah, it's yeah, presentation. Yeah, it's presentation. Again, it's presentation yeah. because you muddle up the questions that we're supposed to ask without, you know, you don't have to put too much explanation into it. Yeah. Whereas if you separate it out, you have a clear explanation and then you can say, to be consistent with the NRC report, we went and did the next step. All right? And the next step shows this. We have to yeah. Yeah. Let's yeah. speak in simple words. In other words, we can say for the pregnant woman or the pregnant women, using the case one, more than five percent are above the hazard or have a hazard index higher than one. Right. If we use case two, it is probably only three percent that are above the hazard index of one. Mm -hmm. If we look at the infants, for both cases we are close at the 95th percentile below the hazard index of one right. and looking at the children we are almost at 95th percentile we are above the hazard index of one using mm -hmm. case one and just below just below using case two that's so this fair. is the first table yeah okay that's fine I would share a concern that's different from that. I think what you've just described is an improvement in how to present this. Mm -hmm. But I still have a, another concern, and that is just mentioning bisphenol A. Bisphenol A has a lot of baggage. Mm -hmm. and it has a lot of people who are activists in making sure that its effect, its concern is maximized. And another group of activists who are certain to make its potential effect minimized. And the only concern I have is that they will find, either one of those extremes will find a way to use our report to their advantage, and sight of the phthalate question will be lost. So I, I don't know how you can do this without, I mean, it, it's a logical question to ask, so I'm in favor of that. I just don't want this report to be carried off by some activists for bisphenol A, to say, ah, see, here it is, here it is, and another report now from the government. I don't want our report to fall into that trap. So all I suggest is caution in not giving a lever here that somebody else can use to their advantage that we didn't intend and that distracts from the usefulness of our report. Right. So if but if we separate the valid question as a main question That'll help. and then we say for due diligence with respect to the NRC report, we did it as, as you know initial cut on other materials yeah. that I think in some ways will deter the argument that yes. you're, you're presenting as becoming the focus because we're not going to focus on them. We're yeah. going to put, maybe we put this other other table in a discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we can make a statement that we're not trying to make a statement on other anti-androgens. We're trying to make a statement about the relative risk <coughs> of phthalates mm -hmm. and consider the exposure to other things that act by the same mode of action. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. Yeah, I, I, I feel comfortable. The, the databases for bisphenol A with respect to anti androgen <laughs> effect profile is very, very poor anyway. Mm -hmm. so. so do we want to just get rid of bisphenol A? Is that the safest thing? Well, In the environment, know. probably, but... <laughs> 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 Okay, well, we can discuss that yeah. if we want to get rid of it later, whatever, but... I'm, but I'm not suggesting that you do. Okay. I just, just I'm suggesting mm -hmm. that we're careful how we lay it out there. Yep. I mean, the, the, just one addition, this uh, this split, w uh, which, which I really fully support, can also be justified in the context of the of the silver book, in the sense of uh, you, you the silver book and the silver book uh, certain scenarios are suggested where the effect of a certain chemical is not only judged in isolation but sort of in the context of, of background exposure to similarly acting chemicals and we can that, that's one way of I would suggest of okay. uh, feeding in the, the other chemicals so so the first table could actually just be a comparison of the two cases 
for the seven phthalates alone yeah. and for the different data sets. Only and four I cases using other. Yeah, if we have other cases. The regulatory reference doses and the European TDIs. But I think if you just kind of compare the um, the values for the seven phthalates alone in the two cases, I mean, you know, the meat of the distribution are very similar. The tails may be somewhat off, but. Um, the tails are so much above one, I don't know, you know how much above one you have to be to point. Well, it also uh, impacts directly on. Uh, no, no, sorry, cancellation. <laughs> what cancellation? So, I mean, I guess, you know, we could look at the same kind of thing for the children. Um, but from this table, I think we could just go down a smidge on that um, table. You know, I think we end up with a similar kind of conclusion. So these are children from NHANES, not the infants. The infants are the SWAN data. The, the children are the NHANES, um, I think, age 6 to 18. Which, which figure is this? So the, it's still on that still same table. table five. But I think the conclusion is the, is, oh, is the oh, same. The okay. distributions are very similar across the two cases, just looking at the seven phthalates. Mm -hmm. um, which again, I think is an important point that we may jump around a lot in terms of choosing what kind of reference doses to look at. But the meat of the distribution here doesn't change that much uh, with the different cases. And I think that's an important take home message. Can I add one thing to children and, and girls? I mean, um, if we include girls in this, and you made a comment about that, the hazard um, index distribution for girls is slightly different than for boys. Uh, there's a bit of a problem there because these, this is based on endpoints relevant only to boys. So maybe we want to omit the girls. This is very strange hearing me say this because I. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So this is the first time in my life I said this. <laughs> <laughs> the girls. Um, but you see my point. I do. The thing is, um, do we have the right reference doses for children and infants? Our reference doses largely were based on um, reproductive or developmental. Things, right? That's right. Fetal development, yeah, right? Yeah. So once you have a one to three year old child, are those the right reference doses? No um, one knows. No one knows, but I wouldn't worry about this too much at this stage because you have shown that uh, small variations in estimating reference doses don't really matter much because the numerator varies so much, the numerator being daily intake. And in the in the absence of any other data, what else can we go by? I think that is a there, it could be justified. Uh, okay. So those are things that we could discuss yeah. either. The each alternative would be to omit this for children totally, which would be a shame. I think I'm actually more interested in the infants than I am the children anyway, but. Yeah, or in infants, I mean. But I would have So. I think we agree that data from the pregnant women is the most interesting one. Because it covers the windows of sustainability. Yep. And looking at the numbers and comparing them with the infants and the children, I think <coughs> the numbers support each other, so I think we can leave it there and uh, there's no need to fiddle around more. Sorry, so back to Andres's point though of getting rid of the, the, the <coughs> girls. I, um, 
We want to break down. Just don't want to. Did you want to stratify to keep them in that thing? Well, so let's look. If, if you look further back, um, I don't think I did a table. I just did a little description. So it's, I'm jumping you around quite a bit, but. Uh, the very last section of the paper, I don't know the page number, but it says analysis of swan and L data. What I still want to add here is the pre and postnatal pregnant women. So I haven't done that yet from the swan data. Table eight of the of this um, gives the monoesters that were measured by swan and L. Um, and just to keep me straight, I also put in the N. Haynes variable name just so, to make sure I have the, the right things linked to the right things. Mm -hmm. um, so we end up with six different phthalates instead of seven here. Um, So those are the those are the variables measured by the Swan data, and then if you go to Figure six just below that, so this is the age distribution of the children, of the baby, the, the infants. Um, so you can see there's a set of about the one year age, about the you know, a little over one, up in the twos and threes. Um, below that is a table that gives the uh, percent above the limit of detection for each of the metabolites. Does that mean anything? Does that mean anything? The percent above the limit of detection. That these found these monoesters were were detected in most of these babies. Because it doesn't really mean anything. Uh, the fact that it was detected to be you know, marginally above the detection limit can be factor 20. That number doesn't Well, it's not, a, number it's not a standard mean. line. I mean, it's a table relative to other things in there before. I, I, I think it's interesting to, to, to point out that these are chemicals that appear together. Um, they're not chemicals that generally are one at a time. Um, that can be easily stated without putting a table up because I think a table is misleading. You're saving in the text without using it. Yeah, it is for savings. Um, let's just keep talking about that. I don't. I'm not going to break. I'm just saying it's misleading. Well, the table doesn't say that 100% of the kids had some measurable level of other limited detection. It just says that. When it was measured, it was between one and two fold of what the limited detection was. Uh, no, it's the percentage. Nine, so these are <coughs> child, the percent of the children that had a value detected above the limit of detection. So it doesn't say what it is. It just says that. There's no, there's no meaning largely. to that number. I didn't read it that way. Yeah, well, that's the problem. You can misread it. Percent of the children above the limit of detection. Yeah. I mean, means it will be just like this. We're going to be all just like this. And without some relevant well, and the point, same, the it, right make, it, make, it, makes, it makes no sense. And there's probably a lot better data in that study to, to quote for meaningful data. But this, so then that, in connection also with the, without making might go all the way around, maybe it wants to, but the, um, the distributions for the and the babies are in the back too, the daily intake estimates. Um, this, this chart. At the very back. I think it's the last. Well, I think it's the next page. It has an index? The, the, the daily intake estimates are in figure th A3. Oh. So again, you get the sense of the distribution of. Um, <coughs> well, I 
I think that's the children. Go down lower. There you go. So these are the estimated daily intake values for the six different diasters for the for the infants on the log scale. And what we see again is that um, the DEHP, I believe, is the one with the highest, uh, you know, mean and median values. Those these are pretty low, thank goodness. So, and then if you go, sorry, Mike, all the way sure. around, so then back to figure seven. So I did a little analysis where I modeled, like I said, I modeled um, the, has, the log of the hazard index as a function of um, baby's gender, baby's age, maternal age, baby's race, and study center. This was, these were across uh, three or four different centers, I think. Um, and girls were significantly higher. Um, there was an increase in hazard index um, uh, by baby age group. So the 12 to 24 month old babies were significantly higher than those that were less than 12. P less than P.001. Um, the babies who were 24 to 37 months old were significantly higher than the baseline of less than 12 months less than 0 0.001. Uh, but there was not a difference in the HI uh, detected across study centers, mother age, or baby race. Um, so what you see, yeah, so Mike's got it up uh, in figure C there. That's the, those are box plots for uh, the different genders. This is again on the log scale, hence the negative values. So zero is actually one. Right? Zero is one, yeah. Right. Pretty much lower than I expected. Mm -hmm. The meat of the distribution is the tails of the that are the concerns. Yeah. Right? And then you see over in figure D is the uh, how it shifts up um, as the children or as the infants, you know, go from less than a year to two to three years old. Which one is this? Um, which figure is this? D? Figure D. Yes, yeah, so I believe this is... Figure 7D? 7D. So this is case one. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure that um, result stayed the same uh, in case two. The baby age group had a p-value 0.139 in case two. Um, so that age-related result may be dependent on the DEHP or something that is uh, the high, the highest percentage of the of the uh, index in case one. So I guess, you know, the, the thing is, I think there's a lot of opportunity to look at this in different ways. Um, I think we can, <coughs> we can study things across different reference doses. Um, if we want to do some more modeling, I'm happy to do that. Um, if there are particular questions we want to ask about the data like that. Is there a case look in um, looking at how this changes with uh, different years and AIMS data? Uh, we have problems comparing them directly, do we? Sorry, changing uh, for the you age. Looked at 2005-6. Oh. In subsequent uh, surveys, they've also measured all these other 
Yeah, so I said I would do that. I would prefer not to go back and do everything again in another data mm -hmm. set, but if we had like certain distributions or whatever, I'm, I could do that. That was on my to-do list, sort of a quality check, you know, like a validation step. <coughs> um, and I maybe would propose that we think about that for the pregnant women, maybe focus on that, um, just to see if we could reproduce a similar kind of distribution. In another data set. Yeah. I mean, it goes back to what Bernie said about the uh, impact of the uh, 2006 date for the for the ban in children's school. Oh. So it'd be interesting if the percentages shifted. Well, what what does that uh, as a distribution look like for? for a year, for, for more recent years. But those tables that had the percentages, you know, the average percentage, um, I didn't do it for the infants, um, you know, like a table seven. Oh, right. Um, I actually did compare, I think this was to some of the intake estimates that you had in, in the court camp and Faust paper. And Oh, that's not percentages. That was actually just based on the distributions. We're pretty similar, except for one of them, and I can't remember which one it was. Do you remember? That actually had a different profile in Europe somehow. Yeah. So it, my point was that you know you can pick up sort of different patterns of usage. So it would be interesting to see if we did that. Mm -hmm. in a, in a, I guess the 2007 and 08. Say again. The ban was in 09. 09. Wasn't it? Yeah. I think it was February 09 was the effective date. And, um, you know, that only, that affects a, narrow, a small number of products. And uh, let's see, in a lot of the, you know, by then the phthalates, I mean, they, they, the use of the phthalates in those products have, has been going down over a 10 year period anyway. So there wasn't an abrupt change in the curve? Well, and I don't think this, I don't think the data are available. Yeah. We could go to 2007. Well, unfortunately, no, yeah. Andreas, I think you, you have the, the publication in mind we did in Germany with the environmental specimen bank where you could see a phase in and phase out of the, some phthalates. Uh, the problem with Enhance is that uh, over the years you had an increasing number of metabolites and it's very difficult to compare the years. Mm -hmm. If you would want to serve, observe trends, it would be uh, sufficient just to look at the metabolite, le metabolite level <coughs> and then the, the dose that the exposure maybe five years ago to DHP has right. been three times higher. So you wouldn't have to have this complicated approach to have the knowledge that uh, right. we observe some trend. Fair enough. Point taken. Yeah. Very good point. Well, struggling with how to link the data from the infants more closely to, uh, I guess, the overall concept. I just, I, I have to think about it a little bit harder. Right? It sort of just sticks out there right now. It doesn't fold in well. Because in the other stuff, you're dealing with large distributions of data, and you're dealing with, you know, Quasi statistically, you know, distributed study. You now you have a 200 children. Um, you're trying to separate it down between <coughs> males and females. And I'm not sure that's, that's worth it. That's worth it to do some modeling. No, I don't know if it's modeling. It's, it's more. 
I don't quite well enough what Dave announces, but we can debate that another day. But the point is that inter basically you're interpreting the data and it's, it stands out on its own, which is fine. But I'm trying to fold it back to the rest of the analysis. Are you doing this as a case study that if we have more data of this type, this is the kind of analysis that can be done? Or I think are you trying to make a record or are you trying to make a statement about children's uh, hazard index, the infant's hazard index with respect to phthalates? I don't know if a study of this type can do that. It's a good case study, but I'm not sure where it fits in how we have to write this report. Because how are we going to take that and go backwards and say, how does it answer any of the questions we have? Because most of, this, most of the kids are very low. Unless we're going to go and take it back to the exposure sets we're going to do and, and see, in fact, we can relate the levels, the hazard index that we observe, the intake that you calculate from this, and we relate it back to what we see in some of the toy products and consumer products that are being used by children at that age group. Well, I think it links in very well. It, it uh, answers directly to the to the charge, to the brief, to the remit. Um, um, if you look at the hazard index distributions, uh, they're very similar. They're very similar to the adults. I don't know whether they're low. And in any case, we are charged with coming up with a rigorous and disinterested analysis of the situation. And children are just part of it. It's directly written down in the. In it's, a good it's a good case yeah. study. Is what I, I look at it. a very solid case study. It actually can be an application for for the, the whole concept of doing this hazard index and then we're linking it to an exposure system based upon the children's related project products mainly, you know, that you <coughs> expect them to be um, receiving during those first years of life or using. I think we discussed it at the last meeting that we were particularly interested in the small children because it's the data with its, its mother-child pairs with the allergenic distance measured. So we agreed at that time that it would be a very interesting population to investigate. So we... I have no problem with that. We all agree. So that's that. the reason well, why... What I'm trying thinking. to think about is how to use it. How to use this analysis most effectively. Because in, in doing the exposure assessment, we're going to be you know, generating scenarios, okay? Now, if we have this group of 233 children, or 334 children, is it wise to then, in addition to the general analysis we're going to do, focus specifically on this age group and then carve out the scenario <coughs> that are most important and see, in fact, if we can delimit the, the limit the analysis in some ways to them to see in fact that there's any plausible relationship between the daily intake you calculate and the daily intake we estimate for that subject. Well, and the, the other thing that we can do that we haven't done, which I thought you were getting to, is um, uh, with the mother-child pair, we can actually see, um, you know, the women who have high exposures, do their children also have high exposures? Um, I mean, that would be interesting. So, and that's work that I haven't completed. So, so we do have the mothers. We have the mothers. Oh, that, would, that would be terrific. Yes. I mean, exactly. if we did that. We have, but we have that, that yet. All right, but, but even so, that would be, that would really demonstrate clarity for this case study. Because mm -hmm. then we could, oh, that would be terrific. It's interesting because people are assuming that like the that. youngest children have higher exposures, and your exposure goes down as you a, get, mm -hmm. get older. And I don't know if this is statistically significant, but that age trend is the 
opposite of that. It's also the opposite of mouthing activity. So it would be, I, I, I probably you can't, I don't know if you can compare these data to the NHANES data, but you can compare no, it to the mothers, that would be. But you see, that was my concern, yeah. Yeah. trying to go back to the NHANES data from this data. In right, right. right. Six years. Yeah. So we, we have. Well, I mean to adults from the NHANES. So we can actually use this as a defined case study mm -hmm. for the hazard index. With, with it, having the mother's data, you can ask, answer the one, the one question about the issue of the mother-child relationship of the hazard index. And then we can do the exposure assessment for that age group specifically and see, in fact, what would the influence would be of projected use of toys or shampoos in that age group and the values in the hazard index that you calculate. See, I, I was worried about the fact that, not, not that it didn't matter, I was trying to figure out how to make it link correctly to what we're trying to achieve. Uh, now it makes more sense. A piece of the puzzle missing yet here. Yeah, it makes more sense now. And it, does it make sense to you guys? Yeah, that's why we uh, wanted to have this population. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. <coughs> I suggest that we take 10 minutes and then come back and refresh for another hour of discussion after that. Bill? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's time to take a 10 minute break. Go to bed. <laughs> I need a party break. <laughs> <laughs> Go to bed. Thank you, Sri. Back. You're back. And Phil, we're going to start with a question from Russ, and then we're going to proceed to another discussion that I'll introduce when we get done with the discussion from Russ's question. Okay. Russ? Sure. Um, so I had a question, I guess, for uh, Chris Holder and the, the committee in terms of looking at the seven phthalates. If we were to also consider an additional approach where it was done, for instance, just for the three phthalates on the interim ban, and see what the distribution of the HI would be. Because you could work under the assumption that if the ban for the other three is permanent, at least in children's toys, what would be the contribution to the HI of the other three? And it's just a thought. It's not something that we need to do. I just wanted to bring it forward. I mentioned it to Bernie briefly. Um, it could be something we reject and don't do, but I, I thought just to think about it. <coughs> I think we've seen from the previous discussions that uh, the picture is already quite complicated, so it should be really overcomplicated. We have individual daily intake data. We have it here. We agreed that we might superimpose on the daily intake data, data the different TDIs and reference doses we have. So we would see for each stellate individually how much of the TDI or reference dose is uh, it or how close the <coughs> individuals are for the individual phthalates. I mean, I, I guess the, the reason the question arose is if you look at the table and you see the seven phthalates, you don't really get a sense is the EHP contributing 70% to the HI? And what about the other ones? But it sounds like part of you said that there will be information for, you know, potentially each one individually to look at how it contributes. And then, of course, someone can do with that what they want, right? Well, I was just going to say, that's what those tables of average per percentages tell you. <coughs> mm -hmm. So that's, mm -hmm. yeah. So that's like, in case one, it ends up that 
the DEHP is the, the large contributor to the hazard index, like 80 something percent on average is due to, to DEHP. But if we change the reference doses down to smaller values <coughs> for some of the other chemicals, um, as in case two, then uh, you know it's a it's a it's not an even spread, but it's the other chemicals contribute more. So these are the, the distributions, the like the figures, right? So so if you look at the corresponding table, they on your left hand. Yeah. So those are tables that talk about. So those. That's <coughs> a, so if you think about each for each subject, there is an eight. There is a hazard index, and so the question is. What's the percentage of that hazard index per subject due to DEHP, DINP, you know, for each of the seven, right? And, yeah. and so everybody is different because their exposure is different. Okay. So what that table is giving you are averages then across subjects. So I think what you can interpret from that is that the sort of what the major contributors right. so, yeah. are. So I, I agree if, yeah, if you look at table seven, for instance, you could ballpark what it would be for, for instance, these two or three phthalates. Yeah. Right. But the contribution is smaller for some other chemicals. Right. But again, that the distribution, that distribution is going to depend on what the reference doses are. So we see more variation, I think, in those tables than we do about the distribution of the index itself, I think. Do, do you know what I mean? So in, ref, in, in case two, the, um, you know, the reference doses are, are smaller than they are, or lower than they are in uh, case one for, for many of the chemicals, handful of the chemicals. And so if you compare um, table, compare table three and table four, Table four, table three, which is from case one, says that the right. average percentage um, for DEHP is 82%. Right, that's much. But for yeah, in case two, problem. in case yeah. two, DEHP's percentage is 53%. Yeah. And you know, DBP is 19%. <coughs> BBZP is 13% on average. So you, you'll comment on that, or it's been commented on? Now? Well, I mean, I probably could, we could write about it more. I have written about it, but I'm sure with comments from you all, we can expand it. This changes quite a bit mm -hmm. in the case one to two. What, so what, what that's telling you is on average what the contribution of each chemical is to mm -hmm. the hazard index, yeah. the distribution of the hazard index. Okay, Russ? Yes. Good. Then what do we do with the rest of the afternoon? There's a question that some of us discussed over the break. And part of it followed a concern that I expressed that I was still having a difficulty <coughs> going from hazard identification to risk assessment. And Andreas clarified for me that we've been talking about risk assessment for the last two hours, which I underappreciated. <laughs> but now I understand that the term hazard, hazard index is really a measure of risk. And we've been using it as you have, you have been using the information of this in the context of biomonitoring data. And the discussion with Paul about the exposure data will allow us to do a parallel risk assessment on a different set of numbers, a different type of exposure. <clears throat> now we can compare the two and decide how we're going to work between these two. So if I understand that part of it correctly, what I would recommend for the rest of this afternoon, I, I may be the only one who didn't understand that well. But I think it would be good to help go through that with everybody so that we're all on the same page as it relates 
to using the hazard index information and the tool and how we're going to match that up with the <clears throat> other exposure data and risk assessment to set the stage for a more in-depth discussion tomorrow about risk assessment. Because even when we have that information in mind from these two methods of providing some, in some quantitative evaluation of relative risks, and this can be by populations, by phthalates, by phthalates plus something else, by a number of the factors that we've been talking about from the beginning, we as a group have to come up with some criteria for how are we going to decide what is sufficient risk to, to support a recommendation. And I don't think we've talked about that yet. But I think it's it's time that we do that tomorrow because by the next meeting we're going to be knee deep in that. So I, I mean this is a topic that sometimes takes groups forever to get their hands around. And I'm not saying that we're going to be one of those, but I think we need to start. And so that's what I would propose for tomorrow is that we have more discussion about how we're really going to array this this family of risks that we're going to have in front of us into a decision that <coughs> this is suggestive of supporting a ban, this is supportive of lifting a ban, this is supportive of putting in a new ban, this is supportive of doing nothing, because we have to translate that array of risks into those categories. And we can do that tomorrow. So, Andreas, would you lead us in the in a discussion piece of the kind that we had during the break to open the discussion for the, the setting the stage but that this is really a risk assessment yeah <clears throat> in the break we did this with the uh, with the aid of a whiteboard and a piece of pen but maybe oh. oh that's a flip chart shall we do that yeah or we can use the, the board yeah. we can use the board mm -hmm. to Flip chart will do, I think. Okay. Can I just get the pen? Um, I've got some here. Okay. And we'll bring this out a little bit. So for uh, single chemical risk assessment, uh, the, the simplest form is done by dividing daily intake by a reference dose that can be an acceptable daily intake, tolerable inta daily intake, whatever. And the demand is that this quotient should be smaller than or equal to one. and if that's fulfilled, the um, attitude of risk assessors is for no case to answer. Um, if this quotient exceeds one, then usually uh, <coughs> a discussion begins with uh, risk managers about risk management exercises. So, th so that, that's the single chemical case. And uh, what the hazard the hazard index is probably really a misnomer in a way, <coughs> uh, because all it is <coughs> all it is is really making the demand that this simple equation here for single chemicals is also fulfilled for for mixtures. So we are now moving from so imagine this. So in the language of specialist mixture toxicology, this is called a hazard quotient. Well, this is really not, not, very, not very good language, but that's what it's called. So the demand is now that the, uh, the hazard index is the sum of hazard quotients, and the demand is that this sum is still smaller than or equal to one. So really we would have... Here's the case for three chemicals. This can <coughs> and we still demand that this 
this could be done for as many campus as you like. But the key point is that the, the sum of these terms here, so in, in, in analogy to here, is still required to be smaller than or equal to one. So uh, we've seen from uh, Chris's and Holger's analysis that under certain circumstances and for a certain number of people, that demand is not fulfilled anymore. The, it depends. We, we, we've seen the numbers. So um, the, the other thing to note is that this equation here, you may wonder why, where it comes from, is nothing but an application of the concept of dose addition of that's an assessment concept in mixed toxicology. And <coughs> it is only justified in cases where uh, chemicals work together along the principles of dose addition. And uh, so what we will have to do in the hazard assessment part of this report is to see whether that actually is backed up by scientific evidence. But really, that's it. So really, we have been, as, <coughs> as Bernie said, talking about risk for the last two hours. Uh, one other thing, uh, how, how then uh, Paul's work would link in here. <coughs> we, we've seen uh, that uh, Holger and Chris have derived these daily intakes through, um, through biomonitoring and, and back calculation, taking into account the uh, toxicokinetics. And what Paul will do is a calculation of this more according to first principles. So let's call it Paul. <laughs> Thanks. First principles. Yeah, first principles. <laughs> and so but what this will enable us to, to compare the two cases. So the estimates for daily intakes derived by um, toxicokinetics and biomonitoring <coughs> and uh, those derived by, let's call it... Uh, External workers. Hmm? External markers. External markers, yeah. So that, that's where this is headed, I think. Right, that's... So the other thing, besides dose addition that we're assuming there, is that we have co-occurrence. That's right. right. To do the combination, which yeah. I think is, is clear from yeah. the biomonitoring data. Um, but maybe yes. we need to look at some correlations across daily intakes or something just to show... The, the question now is what, what do we do when we find in these exercises that the number one is exceeded for a certain fraction of the population. Mm -hmm. But that, that's right. Okay, this exercise answers directly to a couple of items on in the charge in the law, section 108. But <coughs> It goes back to the point I made earlier. Um, my concern is that if we make the a recommendation for or against uh, continuation of a ban, depending on risk assessment of this kind, uh, we will then open the door and invite a substitution process. So, for example, if the answer is that for DHP, uh, these quotients will approach one or exceed one. And on that basis, we say a ban for T8. I, I make, uh, it's just an example. The, the ban should be continued. Um, that means that uh, DHP will then be substituted by, by another phthalate, uh, which then means that uh, the same game begins again. And then, uh, so another phthalate, it could be, it could in principle be a dangerous one, which is currently, currently below one, very far below one, in, in according to this risk assessment, all of a sudden uh, is used more, uh, as a consequence exposure goes up, and then after a time, uh, this quotient approaches one or may exceed one even. So to, to what I'm trying to say here is that in my opinion, any recommendation or decision about ban or otherwise uh, should be based on hazard, not not risk assessment of this stuff. 
However, we have to carry out a risk assessment of this style in order to answer various items uh, in, in, the, in the charge to us. I agree with everything until your last statement. <laughs> hazard. Then why do we bother to do any of it? Because if it's based upon a hazard assessment, then we can just ban everything now. The question is, is that what happens if, let's say, D1, which is, or D2, D3, or something that's in the purview of CPSC, are de minimis, and the only thing that comes up large is something we have no control over? All right, so therein lies a conundrum for us. And it can't just be based on hazard then, because this stuff is out there in the world. You know, it could be in food, it could be in, uh, in all kinds of other, other sources or locations. So I'm not sure I, I agree with you. Everything up to the last statement, I, I, I fully agree. I, I just think we have to discuss this a little bit more before. Yeah, as a, uh, but that's why I said it. Yeah. We need to discuss that. Because there are a lot of there are a lot of permutations to this, which may in fact lead us down another road. Well, the, it, it it hinges around the term how we interpret in um, in number one and two, examine <coughs> all of the potential health effects of phthalates. Mm -hmm. That's open to debate, I think, but it's, uh, some people might interpret it such that this may include risk assessment as well as hazard assessment. Right. I want to come back to your point as well. <coughs> and that is, if we knew the relative hazard of the phthalates and the substitutes, and we had a good handle on that, and we, we discussed this so we really could array them from greatest type of hazard to minimal hazard, <coughs> we would, in order to know what to recommend, we would, wouldn't we still need to know the exposures to say that with that degree, with that type of hazard and this kind of exposure, we would make a recommendation to let, let restrict exposure in some way, in a ban or a number, hmm. wouldn't we? Well, the, the here number um, number three says we're, we're, with, we're the, we have to examine the likely levels uh, of children's pregnant mm -hmm. women and others exposure to thousands. Right. So we have to do. So we, have to look, right. we have to look at. So what, once you have the hazard characterization <coughs> and you have the exposure, then the only thing that remains <coughs> next is to do the risk assessment. Right. Right. I think you know taking the biomonitoring approach and the exposure assessment approach and using it with respect to the RFP gives you a chance to do the local <coughs> risk assessment and do it in a way that you feel comfortable and come up with a credible result. Rather than waiting one versus the other, we can discuss and analyze the information to be able to determine whether or not, you know, what was it, number three we were talking about, the thing about the minimizing the exposure can be best handled in one way or another. You know, it's expanding it or, or, or not. I don't even have to worry about it. Or it's so de minimis that there are other areas that we could be better, better well spend our time. Looking well, at well, I, I would argue that the, the phrase here, consider potential health effects, mm -hmm. means, means risk assessment. Yes, I agree. Yeah, totally agree. agree. Because what else would it be? It couldn't just be hazardous, it? no. Because then it'd be just toxicological. Yeah. So we have to do that, right? But that the the these numbers here, number one through to uh, number eight, do not do not uh, help us. I wish I wish that would have been the case, but uh, the way this is phrased doesn't help us uh, uh, to define criteria for saying this ban should continue the or, or not or otherwise. And that, that is the problem. Agreed. So we have to make them up ourselves. I'm uh, very sorry about this, this is, uh, but this is the way it is.
Well, it's been done many times before by other groups. Yeah. So we're not the first. Yeah. But that is what I see as our task for tomorrow morning, to come as close to that as we can. I agree. Totally agree. I see we're back on the same page. <laughs> Burn? Yes, Phil. I have a question uh, that you may answer tomorrow morning, but I, I, it may be at 5.30 my time tomorrow morning, so I don't know whether I'll be either awake or able to understand at that early time of the day. But I have a question about the interpretation of the hazard index. We, we now have done it, and we have information and as I read the silver book if the hazard index is one or above there's it's likely that there's some risk but we don't know how much risk either in terms of what's the difference between a hazard index of two and four is it twice as much risk no no no. If the book says no, all right, then how are we going to take the information that we generated to make decisions about whether the exposures to phthalates <coughs> individually or in combination, depending on which kind of analysis you do, <coughs> is sufficient to warrant one action or another? I'm not clear how we do that. It, it, uh, Phil, uh, th this, this would be the same as for any single chemical. So if you find that the quotient of daily intake uh, over any reference dose uh, exceeds one, then with single chemicals, everyone knows what to do. So it, it's just if it's a bad one, it's, it's a bad actor. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And it could be a bad actor either because of exposure or yeah. or hazard. Or it doesn't mean necessarily one or the other. It's the combination of the two that can lead to that level of concern. So we, we don't have to take into account, for example, on the 129 pregnant women, if there were only, you know, 2% of those women that exceed a hazard index of one, that doesn't make any difference as opposed to 50 percent well th this now is a it's a That's question a of question. this is a question of the law um, i'm not familiar enough uh, with u.s law but in europe there is an entitlement uh, that you want to protect 100 percent of the population well in the u.s it's not to increase excess risk by one in a million and i forgot what the hazard index is okay well, so there, there's some interpretation. It's a hazard index over one, but the question is, do you... It's not a bright line. The question is, do you... Are you concerned if the hazard index is a little bit over... Is it the mean or exposure or the 95th percentile? There's no hard and fast answers. No. That, that, that is, that's, that's where it gets squirrely. Yeah. You're dealing with okay. the mean or you're dealing with the 90th percentile. It begins a little bit hard. It's a little more <coughs> difficult with the hazard index. Well, the silver book, the silver book, the new philosophy there says, uh, you know, bright red lines have to be regarded with caution and in the context of the decisions that are to be made. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, th that is what we're discussing tomorrow morning, I guess, whether we want to hang any decision on this. We have to carry out, uh, my interpretation of, of the, the charge here would be that we would have to carry out a risk assessment, and this hazard index calculation would be in response to this, but it could just sit there. We could say, yeah, we've done it uh, to the best of our abilities and to the best of what uh, science currently can offer, but uh, it's a second question uh, as to whether we want to make decisions on bands dependent on hazard index exceeding one or not or otherwise. And I've said what my opinion is and that's what we need to discuss. Yep. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. No problem. 
Well, well you, you cited a specific example of an hazard index of two versus four. Is the answer the same for two versus 20? The, the, the um, nominal exceeding of, of one uh, does not give you any handle. It's, it's not really a risk <coughs> computation. It doesn't give you a handle on making statements as to the likelihood okay. of occurring, uh, effects occurring or otherwise. So then how do you distinguish between 0.9 and 2? Good point. You can't. You can't. It's indistinguishable. Well, that, that, is, that, is when, that is why it is important to take into account other factors that you can't quantify, as we've discussed today, say other, ex you know, background exposures to similarly acting chemicals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That can then inform and illuminate your your risk management decisions or risk assessment outcome. You you might think though, um, uh, look at it as the uncertainty in the reference dose itself. The reference yeah. dose is. You have, say, uh, no effect level or some 5%, a f low effect level, 5% or something. In animals, you divide by factor 10. In case humans are more sensitive, another factor in, of 10, because one individual may be more uh, susceptible than another or sensitive than another. Um, so if you have a hazard index of 10, you've, you've lost you know, one of those uncertainty factors, uh, essentially. That's right. So that might be uh, one way to look at it, but mm -hmm. it, it's it's not mm -hmm. a risk per se. It's not really a risk. It's not a pro in the sense that it's not a probability like mm -hmm. people do yeah. for cancer risk assessments. Right. That that puts more pressure on us to come up with uh, another mm -hmm. chapter in here to talk about uncertainties. Because we, if, if you were at a <coughs> hazard index of 0.9 and it was the, the underlying information in, from the toxicology, the animal data, let's say, was a very robust, strong study about which we had a very high level of certainty, that would sway you differently than if that was based on a study that was marginal and repeated the study and they end up with a quite different answer. So you, you would, you have the latitude to take those kinds of things into account. Yeah. But you have that anyway. Well, yes. <laughs> it, it, is that, it has nothing to do with the question you have to ask. It. You have to, it has to be based upon what you stylize as the criteria by which you raise your level of concern. You, know, you, have to have, you have to have a benchmark or a series of benchmarks for saying, well, it's an issue. It's an issue I have to be concerned about. It's an issue I have to be very concerned about. It's an issue if I don't pay attention to, I should hang up my hat and go home and do some, you know, gardening because I don't understand the process and understand the problem anymore. But if, if we, <coughs> as we go through this process, there may be, let's say there are 10 things that mm -hmm. create some uncertainty. We need, I think we need to articulate what those are and how certain we are about the uncertainty and what do we do with it. Well, if we take, just take the, the, the hazard index that um, uh, Chris and Holger have uh, produced so far with the end things they said. Right, you have exactly what I would anticipate. A few people that are have a has an index of about one. And maybe it's two to five percent of the people. Would be logical. Then you have a small percentage of between, you know, fifteen and fifteen percent. Uh, you know, about fifteen percent or eighty-five percent of the, the number of one. But then the rest are pretty low. The question becomes when you get up here and start, you know, summing all these different hazards together, where does it all fit? You know, does it does a hazard associated with with food uh, in, in ingestion in different populations for these people at the 95th percentile far outweigh any of the risk that would be associated with using consumer products that 
have phthalates in it, like hairspray or you know, or, or shampoo. That's where it becomes really naughty, because some of these issues may be background, as was just stated, and maybe these people are in the 95th percentile just have phthalates with high phthalates in it, rather than being exposed to shampoos or teething on a teether that has phthalates in it. So the, the question becomes really one of management of what that risk means in terms of the questions that we have to ask ourselves in the next few months. Other thoughts to set the stage for tomorrow? Make sure you have coffee. If I will. Is, is there anything that we sh is there a, a, I, I'd be first to admit that I have never st structured or managed a discussion about how to arrive at the answer to this question. So for, from those of you who have been in those discussions more than some of the rest of us, how would you recommend we should start tomorrow so that we don't just get buried in the swamp really quickly? Well, I think we, we should uh, begin to discuss criteria that would lead us to say, ban this, don't ban that. I agree with that. I totally agree with that. Because that leads to our charge directly. And it actually makes our job simpler if we do that. Go back to what's behind tab number 10. And go to the second page of that. And this is why it's a number seven. What are the options for recommendations to chat? It is the second page of the document that I titled the process for chat determinations. <coughs> it's a, a two-pager. Oh, dear, but I want to see it. Yeah. So what, what are the, I did this <coughs> to skip ahead to the end and try to identify what are the options that we really have for making some recommendations and what would be to restrict exposure to a specific chemical if it's not already banned. So if it's not anywhere more, it's not banned, but we decide that the data are such that we would recommend that it be restricted in some way, and that could be an error ban or a ban. And secondly, we, think we can also recommend based on this overall analysis to remove the ban on a chemical disorder bed. Or recommend to temporarily restrict exposure if it isn't already restricted. Recommend to remove the temporary restriction if there is one. We can recommend to collect more data on human exposure or toxicity or the mode of action. We can recommend to retain the bans that are currently in place on the sex, chem sex chemicals. Or we can take no action. So those are, those are the options <coughs> as I saw them. So whatever decisions we, whatever recommendations we want to make have to be addressed to one of those. Yep. So you're, go back to where you started, Andrews, you, you you, you said to try to identify that threshold for information about which we would recommend that something be banned. Mm -hmm. 
that would be one threshold that we're looking for. Not not a threshold in a in another yeah, sense. Yeah, this yeah, is just yeah. that, that it's not a bright line. It's just a distinction between now the data are sufficient to recommend this is what we would ban. Then something like that with some level of uncertainty greater than what we had to ban would be to temporarily ban. So the temporariness means that we're not sure and it might be resolved with collection of other data. I would think that a temporary ban would be linked with a recommendation for data. Not, not just that we couldn't decide, so we said it was temporary. Okay. And we, we can recommend that other, da other data be collected, and, but then we need, I think we're obliged to say why, to what end, rather than just say we need more data on this. We need to say if we had it, this is what it would allow us to do. And if we decide to take no action, then, then those are the chemicals that fall below these thresholds for either ban or interim ban. And below that other, below the, the, the lower of those two other decision points, we have to be able to justify to ourselves why we support taking no action. And that engages the criteria that we had for a temporary ban. Mm -hmm. Something is different between those two. We have to be able to articulate what that difference is. Now, does that follow based on what you said that we start to, to talk about what it would take to ban something? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Good, tough question. Bernie, right, I think the the questions that you posed under items five and six of the process for CHAP determinations, um, some of them I think are, are very germane to the discussion that needs to occur tomorrow. Okay, then go back to numbers five and six. What are the risks for humans and points of concern? Vulnerable populations, what are the levels of exposure that are of concern? What are the sources of exposure that are of concern? And I erroneously put down there to evaluate the results of the hazard identification. The hazard identification will do more than that. That's already a risk determination. Yeah, it's a risk. It's a risk analysis. Yeah. yeah. And then in six, in what circumstances are levels of human exposure high enough to be of health concerns? Mm -hmm. Again, what are the sources? What are the chemicals? What are the what population? What are the effects of concern? <clears throat> so, do the answers to those questions help? Define what we would ban and what we wouldn't. Yeah. I, I think I would, in the sense that, of course, you wouldn't ban want to ban anything uh, where, for example, there's no, no human exposure. That would be silly. So, uh, exposure assessment informs informs this decision making yes. process very much. And likewise, I would argue that you wouldn't want to ban anything or any chemical where there isn't. Uh, uh, some degree of concern about health effects in the general population. So that can be informed by some form of risk assessment or definitely hazard assessment. But, okay, it, I, I, I deliberately said informs decisions, but that's not uh, helpful as such because still we would need some hard and good criteria on which to, to base uh, recommendations for banning something or uh, or otherwise. Mm -hmm. And number six, I would change at least one of those phrases to risk. So it's all good about high exposure, hazards, but the word risk is the chat activity should be determined to common, determine a combination that leads to risks of concern. Most circumstances are levels of risk and human exposure. So there's human exposure and hazard that lead to a risk of concern. Yeah. I think we get too hung up on the hazard and, <coughs> and it loses its credibility when we're talking about risk assessment and need both sides of the equation. Andreas, you said something that I want to follow up on is those chemicals for which there is no known human exposure. But if we have a, a chemical that presumably would be suitable as a substitute, it would be a replacement for one that is being used if there's an action taken to get rid of it or to minimize its use, 
<coughs> and there's another phthalate out here that we know is five, six times more potent than the ones that we're worried about today. But there isn't any known exposure, but it could it could be geared up for manufacturing fairly easily. And in a year's time, we'd have a high level of exposure to that one. Yeah, yeah. And we were silent on it. Yeah, you're right. That this this would be. Uh so if, if, answer that, yeah. if we know of some chemicals of that kind, I think we have an obligation to make a statement that even though we don't know what the risk is, because we don't have exposure to it, based on the toxicity alone or some other factor, we would be concerned yes. about this one being put into commerce. So basically, in a situation where there is no exposure, our contenders would have to be raised and our concern would be re re reignited if in fact they want to put into project yeah. products where there will be exposure. Yeah, because it isn't in commerce, there's not a demand. Right. But we would like to precaution right. against it being brought into commerce. No, it's risky to do that because we have, we weren't charged and we don't know what else is out there that would fall into that category. One has come to our attention, but we don't know how many others are out mm -hmm. there. But perhaps one as an example is enough. Okay. Maybe that's the day's work. Yeah. Eight thirty tomorrow. Anybody object if we adjourn right now? Okay. Well then we'll call you when the coffee's ready in the morning. Very good. Don't get it. Have a good dinner. Okay, thanks. Bye bye. Bye. bye.